Good morning. How many of you have done a pediatric cataract? One, two, three. Okay. Then I, please, this talk is not meant for you. So uh, we see all types. Etiologies can be very different, but some part remains same, starting from a posterior anticonus to a steroid-induced cataract. There's a whole portfolio of cat cases we see in our uh, our children, basically, here. So in, when you plan surgery, these are your steps which you must do, evaluation, anesthesia, and a lot of it Dr. Jaspreet has already covered. So I'm going to straight away jump to the surgical techniques. So these are your steps while doing surgery in this. So how do you do wound, wound construction? You can use either a corneal scleral tunnel or a corneal tunnel. Both are perfectly acceptable, give equally good results. And if you are a beginner, probably scleral tunnel is recommended because it is definitely, uh, uh, definitely more forgiving and you can put sutures. You don't have to remove sutures because it will be covered by conjunctiva. And if you are using a non-foldable lens, which uh, sometimes in community settings we are forced to do, uh, please definitely use a scleral tunnel instead of corneal, irrespective of the size of the wound, whether it is 2.2 or 3.2 or 4.5, you definitely need to be sutured uh, in almost children up to 12 years of age. Even side entries may need suturing in infants and toddlers. So uh, in the first, this is a corneal scleral wound, you can see. And you can see it's co you are going to make a little bit of a conjunctival opening, and that sometimes is uh, can be a problem for uh, these. Some of these children may need glaucoma surgeries later on. So less you touch the conjunctiva, it is better. But a small and clean conjunctival opening does not hamper any glaucoma surgery in future. Of course, now we have shifted to a cleocorneal incisions. Like here, you can see it's. Uh, So it's, you can see the depth of the tunnel is not much, so it is a little less forgiving compared to corneoscleral sutures, and you may, uh, and it, but it's easier in one step. You don't need cautery, so definitely sh faster. Now coming to the anterior capsulotomy, which is, follows the uh, wound construction, it is the key step in surgery, and children have elastic capsules, and they have a tendency to extend is very high. A forceps, a microcapsular or a uterata forceps is probably easier than doing it with needle. Uh, older children, you can do needle also. Uh, tearing forces should be always directed towards center, and it is important to regrass the flap every two to three clock hours to maintain control over the size and shape of your rexis. And always aim for a smaller size because you will end up with uh, larger than what you anticipated. So in the capsular rexis, the holy trinity of a good OVD uh, instrument like a forceps and stains are absolutely indispensable. This cataract few years back when stains were not available when I started my practice uh, would have been almost impossible. I would have used a light pipe to see uh, using the illumination and then also there was a good chance that I might have extended it. But now with thanks to the staining, thanks to having a very really stable anterior chamber, it is really uh, not that difficult. And as you can see, my forces were or te tearing were always directed towards center. And allowing a microcapsular fossa also allows me to do the rexis without doing a main tunnel, and you can do it through side entry through a small incision as I am doing here. Sometimes you will run into trouble uh, with a fibrous capsule, and you can see here even the small entry you may have to do with a, actually a micro uh, scissors, and you have, may have to actually go and cut the capsule into uh, adequate shape. And yes, since one good thing about this kind of fibrous capsules are the tendency to run away as long as you stay in that fibrous area is very minimal and you can definitely enlarge it after making these kind of radial cuts later on to make it a little adequate size and use uh, vitrector to do slightly enlarge it. And this is as safe a bag as it can be. Uh, newer technologies to do rexis, you can do a precision pulse capsulotomy. Um, which is uh, you, uh, which is an instrument which where you can get a very very regular and very very predictable capsulotomy, but not that can be a little difficult if the anterior chamber is shallow and you have a really small eye. Um, 
femtolaser capsulotomy has been described, but again, not, not possible under general anesthesia, but if a child is older, you could do it before you take the child uh, into the theater for the rest of the surgery under anesthesia. Now, after lens aspiration, you have to manage the posterior capsule in the first sitting only because VAO rates are close to 100%. And uh, primary posterior capsulotomy, just as we do anterior vitrectomy, is the gold standard. But younger children may need uh, anterior vitrectomy along with posterior capsulotomy to maintain a clear visual access. Vitrectomy can be obviated by using either a special lens like uh, a bag in the lens technique or you can use a posterior uh, optic capture also if you do not wish to do vitrectomy. Both these techniques compare well with primary posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy with preventing visual access opacification. So again, the principles are same. You make a small opening and uh, use a red reflex so that uh, you only a retroillumination because it gives you, allows you to visualize the flap really nicely under, uh, against a red background. You don't need stainings because your red reflex acts like a stain here and your forces again as you can see two to three clock hours at a time and grasp and regrasp till it is complete. Uh, uh, posterior capsulotomy is easier than anterior capsulotomy uh, on, in almost every. Sometimes you may end up with uh, posterior capsular dehiscence as you can see here uh, once so since it was a little anticipated I have gone with a vitrector straight away to aspirate the lens also and Again, you can, you can regularize this uh, posterior capsular dehiscence and uh, use a good OVD here to place the lens uh, very comfortably in the bag without a risk of extension. If you just take away the edges where there is flaps to put it in the bag comfortably and fairly safely. Uh, sometimes in rare situations, uh, you may you may place the IUL first and then do a vitrectomy, like in this case. Um, okay, we'll, I think we don't have time for this. So this is the bag in the lens, and uh, you can. And there is another by Dr. Sukhija who spoke. Their group has published their reports with posterior capsulotomy, and I borrowed this uh, from their publication. The bag in the lens is, is where both the flaps of your are placed in the in a flap around uh, both the flaps of anterior and posterior capsule are placed in a groove which is made in the lens as you can see here and uh, in posterior capsulotomy after you have done the anti posterior capsulotomy you push the uh, push the optic behind the behind the posterior capsulotomy so that it kind of uh, both anterior and posterior uh, rexis close over each other and that also almost prevents any kind of pco now lenses can be anything, IOLs, any of these lenses you can use. PMM lenses are perfectly safe. Three-piece, single-piece acrylic foldables and single-piece uh, foldable lenses have really changed the game. Bag in the lens is not available yet in India. And uh, similarly for iris fixated lenses and artisan IOLs, we have little less evidence that they work well in children. But they are increasingly uh, being used uh, in some children with poor capsular support. So they were, as I said, they were game changers and they allow a closed chamber, uh, in clo fairly closed chamber without leak and also allows us to place the lens really safely into bag through a smaller incisions. And they are very useful in simple as well as complicated situations as there is less manipulation which is required and inflammation has almost gone down to zero with these lenses. So IULs have also led to more questions. What age you should implant? What is your target refraction? And what is the IUL power calculation? So one year onward is IUL is the standard of care, but rest in 2024, it's more of an anatomical decision and not so much the age. Uh, I would still consider IUL implantation in any eye with corneal diameter of at least 10.5 millimeter and axial length of 18 and no ocular comorbidities. There are ifs and buts in that, but when it comes to under one year of age, these are the criteria which I use. If you are in doubt, if your surgical skills are not adequate, a good aphakia is always comparable to pseudophakia in infants. You can always put IOL later, provided you do a clean, situ clean surgery. In some situations like JRA-induced uveitis, uh, probably uh, pseudophakia is still better than uh, pseudophakia. We have sorted out the age, but we still don't know what to put. And this is fraught with errors in younger children, especially if you are going to do a 
DBR in uh, under general anesthesia. Uh, always remember, smaller eyes, your smallest error will get magnified and you will get a much more larger error in your uh, post-operative refraction, even if you have got a small uh, error in your axial length calculation. There are a lot of conflicting data published in different, looking at different formulas, and uh, still there is no co consensus that this formula is better than that. We have done some work in Indian eyes on Barrett's universal formula, and we found that comparable to a standard older formula like uh, 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 SRK2 or SRKT. What can go wrong? These are all complications. Some of them, like glaucoma and retinal detachment, can occur many years later. Rest are all between inter intermittent and uh, immediate and intermittent period. Uh, visual rehabilitation is the most important part of surgery. No surgery is successful unless you do this, refraction and prescription of glasses as early as in first week. I give it routinely on fourth day, appropriate occlusion if required, and follow-up. Follow-up is the, how meticulously you follow-up is your, is the, is the measure or metric by which you should, uh, chance, uh, you should measure your success. And surgery is just a very, very st uh, small and very s easy step on a very, very long road. Uh, schedule of follow-up depends on age and visual status, but up to three years, child should be seen every four months, every six months till 10 years, and once in a year all their lives. What follow-up entails? It entails refraction and vision check, because VAO can undo your beautifully done surgery within few days, intraocular pressure on every follow-up visit, and a dilated fundus examination on every visit, including a very careful look at the disc. What lies ahead? We are looking for better biometry calculation, better designed IOLs, and we have to need to be prepared for long-term complications, which we still are not dealing with. When these children will become 45 and above, there will be probably a slew of other things which may come, which we don't know yet. Like, this is my 20-year-old follow-up. Vision is still maintained, but you can see the lens is looking dull. It is a good acrylic foldable lens, but I know I may have to replace it in another 10 years. God only knows. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sushma.